Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at our second set of notes from Chapter 7, primarily dealing with Section 7.4, because we're skipping 7.5 now that we don't really need to get into that concept. Uh, but there's one thing we're going to add at the beginning. Okay, ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from the ground state of a gaseous atom or ion. Now, this is a concept that is really core to the new version of the AP test because one of the things you're supposed to be able to do is predict what's happening with a variety of things about an atom based upon its ionization energy and tie the electronic structure of an atom to its ionization energy. So ionization energy is probably the most critical trend in the chapter to really get a good grasp on. And there's a number of things you need to understand about it. Now, first off, we can pull one electron out of an atom, and then we can pull a second and a third and so on. So we differentiate ionization energies into which ionization energy? The first ionization energy is the energy that's required to remove the first electron from a neutral atom. So if we have sodium gas and removing one electron, then we're going to get Na plus, and our other product would be the electron which we remove. So that's what the equation for um, what we're talking about as the first ionization energy would be. And it would literally be the energy required to remove that electron. So remember, we have to put energy in to that if you're talking about an endothermic situation. Now, if we have a first ionization, and I've differentiated that fact, it makes sense that we're going to talk about other ionizations as well. And being able to compare and understand them is an important part. So the second ionization energy it would be the energy that is required to remove a second electron. So now we've got Na+, plus, we've already taken out one, and we're looking at the energy required to move, remove the next one and make Na2+. Plus. Now, that doesn't mean that sodium is commonly found as an Na2+, plus ion. I'm talking about how much energy would it take to remove an and another electron from the sodium ion. So we've already removed one, now we're going to try and remove another. And how those ionization energies compare is an important idea to be able to analyze. Now it requires more energy to remove each successive electron, and that should make sense based on concepts of effective nuclear strength. If we've taken away one electron, we now have minimized some of the electron-electron repulsion that no longer exists, and the remaining electrons should be held on much more strongly by the nucleus. So it makes sense that it should require more electrons uh, or more energy to remove each successive electron. So you'll see as we go from first to second to third, there's always an increase in ionization energy, and you should understand why. Now, when all valence electrons have been removed, the ionization energy increases dramatically. So there is a huge jump, and this is a really important idea because it tells us something about how many valence electrons the atom has. So it helps us to see electronic structure. So you should really understand and be able to interpret what you're seeing in this picture here. Now, why does it increase so dramatically when sodium goes from its first ionization to its second ionization? It's almost an increase in, um, uh, what is it, uh, a factor of 10. So it's not just a little bit bigger, it is a massive amount bigger. And the same thing would be true with magnesium. When you go from the second to third, there is a huge jump. So why is it that every once in a while you see a huge jump in consecutive ionization energies? Well, think about it. If you re have removed all of the valence electrons, you've now gone to the next higher energy level. So Case in point, inner level p electrons are close to the nucleus, and this gives them a much higher effective nuclear strength, and they're much harder to remove. So once we've moved our valence level s and p electrons, and we're now on a new inner level p as our highest level, they're going to be much closer to the nucleus. And by Coulomb's law, they're going to be significantly harder to remove. Remember, distance kills attractive forces. So the less the distance, the stronger the attractive forces. So that's why we see this big jump. When we've lost our valence level electrons from either an S or a P, we're now dealing with an inner level P, which is significantly closer to the nucleus and much harder to remove. And you should really understand this concept of why there is this big break as that happens across the board. So what we're really looking at is where we have that break, that's probably going to be our most stable ion. So Mg2 plus would be what I expect to see my stable ion for magnesium, because to remove a third electron is a huge increase in energy. Same would be true with Al3 plus and Na plus and so on. So know how to predict 
the charge of an element based upon this data and also understand its implications as to electronic structure inside the atom. In other words, how many valence electrons we probably have. That's what this information is telling us. It can also tell us when we have an increase when we go to a when we're, when we're removing from a P rather than an S and the first PN versus the second PN. So there's a lot of things we can differentiate using ionization energy differences. Now, trends in first ionization energy. As one goes down a column, less energy is required to remove an electron. Well, think about why. Think about what has been the case for every single um, time we've talked about a group trend, because that's what we're looking at here is a group trend going down. Well, remember, for atoms in the same group, the effect of nuclear strength doesn't really change all that much. But what is different is that the valence electrons are farther from the nucleus and distance kills attractive forces. So just like every single time where we're talking about a group 10, we're talking about a greater N. And the farther are you away from the nucleus, the easier it is to remove an electron by Coulomb's law. Distance kills attractive forces. So just like every group trend before this, our group trend is about increasing N. Now, as you move across a row, it then gets harder to remove an electron. Why? Same thing we've talked about every single time. As you go from left to right, effective nuclear strength is increasing. We've got a stronger nucleus, and we're not adding more core electrons, so we're not increasing our shielding effect all that much. So the nucleus gets stronger and stronger and stronger, which means atom sizes get smaller, ion sizes get smaller, and if the ionization energy increases. You have to fight the nucleus to remove that electron. So when you go across, the general trend is that it gets harder to remove electrons, so ionization energy increases, and that's because of an increase in effective nuclear strength. Now, you'll notice this is not in your notes, but we're going to talk about why something would go against the trend, which is an idea that you really should have an understanding of for freshman chemistry. On the plus side, this means it's not going to be something that's on my AP test or on the AP test when you take it in May, because they've said um, that Things that uh, anomalies, basically, in uh, electron configurations and trends aren't things that they're going to stress anymore. So I do want to talk, however, because if you understand the ideas, you can apply them and really see what's happening. And this is something that they would expect you to understand in freshman chemistry. The first really occurs between groups 2A and 3A. So when you're looking across the group, what we're really talking about is when we go from something like beryllium to boron or magnesium to aluminum. That's the, the first inconsistency in our trend in ionization energy. Now, in this case, what you're looking at is um, where you're removing electron from, a p orbital rather than s an s orbital. And this is something I hinted at a second ago. And this is something that we should understand based upon data. And this is a part of the AP test. So I guess as a conceptual idea, this is something you really should understand for the AP test as well. Now, the S electrons and the D electrons for period three provide some shielding for the P electrons. So remember, when we're pulling from the P, we have S electrons that will help shield our P electrons. So when we go from beryllium to boron, Boron actually has two S electrons that are shielding its nucleus in that 2S core when we're talking about our, you know, removing a 2P electron. So therefore, it's a little bit easier to remove that 2P electron than it is to remove an S electron. So beryllium is actually a little bit higher in ionization energy. It's a little harder to remove that beryllium electron than it is to remove the fifth electron in boron, which is coming from a P orbital rather than an S orbital. And that really deals with the fact that you have more shielding electrons in the case of a P from our inner, for, from our S on that uh, same energy level, and therefore it's a little bit easier to remove that. But very quickly the trend goes back to getting harder again. So that's the inconsistency between group two to group three is because we're moving an, a P versus removing an S. And remember, those S electrons help shield the P electrons a little bit from the nucleus, making them for a brief period of time a little bit easier. Now, we also get an inconsistency that happens between group 5A and group 6A. So this would be like between nitrogen and oxygen in the second period. Now, in order to understand what's happening here, you have to think about what's happening based on Hund's law and the actual sublevel that's involved. In the case of nitrogen and oxygen, we're looking at the 2P sublevel. And in nitrogen versus oxygen on the 2P sublevel, 
let's take a quick look at what we've got for nitrogen and a quick look at what we've got for oxygen. Now, nitrogen basically has this configuration. It's got three electrons in, so each orbital has one electron, and that's it. And in the case of oxygen, we have an extra electron, so our first 2p has an extra electron in there. Now, remember, when we squeeze a second electron in that orbital, then there's going to be greater electron-electron repulsion in there. So to remove this electron right here, that greater electron-electron repulsion caused by that other electron in the orbital is going to make it a little bit easier to take out this electron in oxygen than it is to take out that electron in nitrogen. So the P4 electrons, which is what we're really looking at in the oxygen here, has some electron-electron repulsion that aids us in removing the electron. And that's enough to give us a slightly easier situation there. And it happens at each of these spots. Um, until eventually we get a bunch of d electrons, which then confuse the issue. So we've got a couple of things here that if we look at really what's happening based upon our type of orbital or a Hun's rule situation, a P3 situation versus a P4, it's really not hard to see why there are a couple of inconsistencies in there. Now to finish our notes, because this will be it for what we want to talk about today, I also want to bring up one other trend. Now we're going to get heavily into electronegativity in Chapter 8, so this is from the next test, but it makes sense because it's another predictable trend that we can see on the periodic table. And this is an idea that you saw last year and used quite a bit, so electronegativity is something that shouldn't be unfamiliar with you. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom and a molecule to attract electrons to themselves. So when we're looking at a water molecule, we have hydrogens bonded to oxygens, and electronegativity is how strong this hydrogen holds on to those electrons in the bond versus how strong the oxygen holds on to those electrons in a bond. So that's what electronegativity is. It's a rating of how strong the nucleus of one atom holds on to electrons in a covalent bond. It's about effective nuclear strength and nuclear strength. So on the periodic table, if you look at our numbers here, electronegativity increases as you go across. Well, remember, effective nuclear strength is increasing, and this is a measure of how directly our nucleus is holding on to those electrons. And then when you go down, electronegativity appears to decrease. Well, that makes sense, too, because as N increases, it negates effective nuclear strength, and that increase in distance kills your attractive forces, making it easier to remove electrons. So it's not holding on to electrons in the bond quite as strongly. So electronegativity is a, definitely a related idea to trends that we've been looking at. And notice once again, the exact same trend across and the exact same trend down. And that ends our second set of notes over Chapter 7.